Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, really uh, sorry for the delay. I just got out of the Oval Office with the President who wanted uh, me to relay uh, a, few a few new messages to you all on Hurricane Barrel. Uh, this is important to him, and he knows it's important to the people of Texas, so he wanted to make sure that uh, bef before I came out here, I had all of this information. So the President spoke with Houston Mayor Whitmire and Harris County Judge Lena Hidalgo about the impacts of Hurricane Barrel and they both asked for help from the federal government. Because of the governor of Texas is currently out of the country, the president then called the lieutenant governor of Texas to ensure that Texans are getting the resources they need and deserve following this devastating storm. On the call, the president raised the need for a major disaster declaration and immediately approved it while on the call when the lieutenant governor requested it. With this major disaster declaration in place, we will be able to provide life-saving and life-sustaining activities. The president and his team have been working around the clock for the past two days to ensure Texas has the resources and tools needed to respond to Barrel and keep Americans safe. Officials from the U.S. Coast Guard and FEMA have been on the ground and senior White House officials have been in constant contact with their counterparts. While the storm has passed, our greatest concern right now is power outages and extreme heat. So we want to encourage residents to remain vigilant as temperatures rise, especially older adults and those with underlying health conditions. Fortunately, 800,000 have had power restored overnight, and we expect another 1 million to have their power restored today. The federal government has also offered generators to help reduce the impact of the power outages. The president continues to take decisive action to help the people of Texas recover, and he looks forward to working with the state to get more critical resources to the people that need them. I also want to share one additional scheduling item with all of you as well at the top. In addition to many NATO meetings we announced yesterday on Thursday afternoon, President Biden will meet with President Zelensky of Ukraine to discuss our unwavering support for Ukraine as it continues to defend itself from Russian aggression. That meeting will be at 1.30 p.m. at the Convention Center, which, as you all know, is where the NATO sessions are being held, and it will take place just before the NATO-Ukraine Council meeting. This will be the third meeting between both presidents in recent weeks following their sit-down in France and also a sit-down at the G7 in Italy, and it will further demonstrate the strength of the partnership between our countries. <clears throat> and finally, uh, just a, a personal note here, I wanna say a few words about Sam Michel here, who uh, served as acting deputy press secretary for the part of a well, good part of this year. Uh, we are sad that today is indeed his last day, but we are so grateful uh, for his service. And uh, he has been inc an incredible colleague. He has, we were lucky to have him on our team, on our press team. His sharpness, his ability to stay calm on under pressure and his strategic thinking has been a real asset uh, to us all. Sam, you will be greatly missed. Thank you so much uh, for being on the team and stepping in when we stepping in when we really needed you. Okay. All right. Uh, Song Mei. Thank you. Um, I just want to get a clarification on the letter that was sent last night sure, absolutely. Um, from uh, Dr. O'Connor. Um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it didn't seem to explicitly describe the nature of Dr. Kennard's meeting with Dr. O'Connor. So can you say whether that one meeting was related to care for the president himself? I can say that it was not. It was not. Okay, that's great. Um, and can I just ask why that information that was released last yeah. night um, just wasn't said at the briefing yesterday? Well, no. Actually, a lot of what is in the letter was said at the briefing, to be very, very clear. I said many of the things that were laid out in the letter was actually repeated right here behind this lectern at this podium yesterday. Uh, it right, was so what said that. Hold on. I, I said many of the things, many of the things, uh, and we got clarifi uh, clarification, obviously, from Dr. O'Connor, uh, but it was in line uh, with what I said when I said only three, right? I said only three visits uh, that this particular doctor uh, had. I said a neurologist. What I was not able uh, to confirm is the name and the reason why is because we do not share uh, private information 
Uh, that is something that we respect, uh, and we wanted to make sure that we protected our consultants here that work with the White House Medical Unit, their security as well. And so that is the one thing that I was not able to confirm. Obviously, uh, Dr. O'Connor's letter confirms that, but we had to get permission from Dr. Kennard and also the president in order to put that information. And it is not normal. And that also states that in Dr. O'Connor. Uh, but many of the things that I said right here uh, at this podium is in the letter. And can I just also ask a little, this is the second time in less than a week where the briefing had prompted a need for later clarification on questions about the president's health. And I'm just wondering if you could speak to... So I disagree. I disagree, Song Ming. It's not. Yesterday, a lot of the things that I said right here in this briefing room, I know you were not in the briefing room, I actually, it's in the letter. It was in the letter. It was being cor incorrectly assumed and insinuated that the president had seen Dr. Kennard uh, more than three times. I said that it was only three times that the president had seen a neurologist. I didn't confirm the name, but I did say it was only three times. It was being incorrectly assumed and insinuated that the president was being treated for Parkinson's. I said right here that the president was not being treated for Parkinson's. I actually went a step further and said he wasn't taking medication for par Parkinson's. I said that right here. It was also being assumed and insinuated that uh, Dr. Kernod was someone who only worked uh, on Parkinson's when in fact he's a general neurologist. That was something that Dr. O'Connor was actually able to confirm that he was uh, a general neuro neurologist, not, not in fact a general neurologist. And we also wanted to set the, we just wanted to set the record straight. And so, uh, you know, it is important. We believe it was important to all of you. I actually even said here at the podium, if there was more information that we could provide, we would do that. We would do that. And we did. Uh, but many of the things that I said right here is in the letter. Is in the letter. Does the president feel like he's beat back this effort to force him to step aside? Look, you know, um, you heard the president yesterday when he called into Morning Joe, did about 18 minutes uh, of uh, Q&A yesterday morning. He spoke, very, he spoke very, very, I think, forcefully, passionately about where he stands, about how he sees things moving forward. Uh, and we also have said many times we respect. We respect uh, members of Congress. We respect their view. But I also want to say there's a long, also a long list of, um, of congressional members who have been very clear and in support of this president, whether it's the CBC, who gave a full, th full support, uh, the Congressional Black Caucus, for folks who are watching and are not sure what CBC is. Uh, they were very much supportive. They said, we think that, uh, this is uh, Representative Joyce Beatty, to, to be clear, we think that the call went extremely well. The president was very responsive. Representative Troy Carter, who's also a member of the CBC. Uh, he was elated to hear directly from, from the president and that he is all in, and we are all in with him. You heard from, you got a uh, Congressional Hispanic uh, Caucus. They put out a statement in full support of this president, and there, there are others. And so, look, he is going to focus on continuing to work on behalf of the American people, continuing to build on an unprecedented record uh, that he's been able to get done with many of these congressional members that he's proud to be to have worked with. Uh, but uh, that's his focus right now. That's his focus. He's still talking to more people, more more. He's going to continue to engage, uh, as you saw him in Pennsylvania when he was on, you know, when he was in the Commonwealth uh, on the road. He's, he had uh, two. Of the two of the senators, two of the congressional members with him, the House members with him. Uh, he's going to be traveling later in the week. He's going to be engaging. Uh, I've mentioned, I mentioned yesterday his robust schedule for the next two weeks when he's in state. He certainly will continue to engage. I don't have a, a list of additional uh, additional uh, calls to, to read out, but he did CBC last night, Congressional Black Caucus, uh, and he's going to continue and engage as he has been. Good, Mary. To follow on that, the president has made clear he's done talking about the debate. It is time to move on. Yeah. But some of his allies have made clear they're very much still in this wait and see mode. I mean, Senator Patty Murray saying he must do more to demonstrate he can campaign strong enough to beat Trump. Senator Durbin saying he's concerned whether this is just a one-off or a larger issue. So I guess, you know, how worried is the president that despite his best efforts, he's not going to be able to close the book on these concerns? And Mary, I appreciate the question, but as you know, there are hundreds of members in Congress, hundreds, and I laid out 
a list of folks who have supported him. Uh, we've heard from Senator Coons, we've heard from Senator Fetterman. Uh, there's support there as well for him. Uh, and so we just want to make sure that we put that out there as well. It's a party united behind Absolutely, him. absolutely. And look, Representative Gregory Meeks said, coming out of the Congressional uh, Democrats uh, meeting, said that they're united. And you just saw the Dem caucus leadership uh, take questions from some of your colleagues over uh, at the Capitol. Uh, so that is important as well to note. But look, he had a bad night. We've talked about it. Uh, he understands people's concerns. We have been out there, as we have been in previous months, but out there obviously in the past 10 days, more than 10 days now uh, since, uh, since the debate. And you see from his engagement with everyday people on the ground, uh, you see him with congressional members uh, having, who are showing their support, speaking on behalf of this president while we're on the ground uh, in, in, uh, in that respective state or commonwealth being where we were in Pennsylvania on Sunday. And so we're just going to continue that. But look, what we can say, what I can say is, look, we respect, we respect people's opinion. These are, you just mentioned two senators that we were very proud working with uh, over the past three and a half years to get historic, uh, historic legislation done. And that's what we want to focus on. You're right, we do want to turn the page. You heard me say this last week. We want to get to the other side of this. We want to continue doing the work. And that's what the president's going to do. And just to be clear, does he have plans to talk with leadership again soon? I don't have any uh, calls. We don't have calls to read out or, or, or to preview. He is going to continue to engage. I just don't have anything right now uh, to share at this moment. He talked to CBC, uh, again, the Congressional Black Caucus uh, members yesterday. They had a very, very good call. Uh, and so he's going to continue to engage. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Um The White House has obviously fielded a lot of questions in recent days about the President's health, whether the White House has been forthcoming or not about that issue. And I just wondered, um, have the last 12 days made you reconsider any specific statements that you might have made in recent months on, on that issue? I, look, I appreciate the question. I really do in the opportunity. I think there has been moments here when I have said, and I said, especially in the gaggle, I think, uh, and, and actually yesterday, uh, if I if I have uh, you know uh, uh, said misled in something that I've said or haven't had the full information, I actually own up to that, and I actually say I will do my best to get you the information. Hence the letter, hence the letter for Dr. O'Connor, right? And so um, uh, I will, you know, I've always said I've always been committed to doing the best I can to give you the information that we have. That is a commitment from the team. It has been an unprecedented time. I think you guys could admit that, right? It is an unprecedented time. And so we are meeting the moment, a new moment that has never really existed before. And so we wanna make sure that we get you all the information that we have. And when we don't have it, we do try our best to provide that information. Uh, and so, that is something that I'm going to continue to do. And I've always said it is an honor and a privilege to be standing in front of you every day, exercising in the freedom of the press. This is, uh, this is a briefing that is watched around the world because we lead in democracy, right? We lead in the freedom of the press and what that looks like. Honor and privilege, and I will continue to do my best to do just that. And, and we certainly understand, you know, you speak on behalf of the president and you defend him, his actions, his positions, his policy positions included. Um, could I just ask you about one example, just going back, uh, that comes to mind? September... In the past, we were talking about the last 12 days. I'm, I'm talking about <laughs> the recent, just, well, recent you, months. No, well, you just said recently it's been, you know, we've been going back and forth. And so in the last, you know, 12 days or so, that was that's how I believe that's how you asked yeah, me the question. I, I, I was talking generally. Okay. Um, but if I could just ask you about one example. I mean, look, if you're going to ask me about something from months ago, it probably would be fair for me to, I probably won't be able to answer that right away, whatever it is that you're, you're well, going you to say to me. Come back to us. Yeah, yeah I'm happy to do that. But. Um, but it's also to, to say, hey, from September of whenever year, right, that is, uh, that is something that I probably should give a little space to kind of see exactly what you're speaking of. Okay, right? and, and that's fine if yeah. that ends up I, being No, I just want to make sure response. that we sure. kind of give some context here. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you'll remember this. Uh, this was an event where the president yeah. um, called out Congresswoman Jackie Walorski, yeah. looked for her in the room even though she had recently died, um, you told multiple reporters at the time, and yeah. this was asked in multiple different she ways. She was top of mind. Um, right. Yeah. It was because she was top of mind yeah. for the president. I mean, would you 
On, on that example, would you offer a different explanation? I would not, because honestly, I spoke to the president right before coming out that day, and that is what the president told me. It's not something that came from me, that is something that came from the president. So, so he was saying, even she, as he was she looking for her in the moment, it wasn't a she was top. She was top of mind. Okay. I, that is coming, as you just said in your question, I speak for the president, I, I speak on behalf of him, that was coming from him, and I was delivering directly from the president what he was thinking at the time. Great. A very different kind of example, and this is more recent. Oh, um, sure. Sure. Uh, when the president was in Italy for the G7, and okay. you remember he skipped one of the leaders' dinner, mm -hmm. which was a major event for the summit, and I remember you were asked about it by reporters, and you said, you know, we shouldn't read too much into the fact that he's skipping one dinner. I mean, yeah. what would the explanation actually have been that he was tired and that he needed to skip I something that I, was happening so late in the And evening. my answer stays the same. I wouldn't read too much into it. It's not the first time that he has. Uh, he has uh, a really busy schedule, and there's a lot going on. As you know, when the president is abroad, he has continued to do domestic stuff as well as, uh, uh, as, well as meeting with global leaders. And so I truly would not read too much into it. Uh, and I will leave it there. Okay, I have a very final question on the, the annual <laughs> okay. um, sure, sure. letter from Dr. O'Connor. Uh, he said that the president continues to be fit for duty and fully executes all of his responsibilities without any exemptions or accommodations. Just because it's been a couple of months, do you know if that statement is still accurate? It's still accurate. So no exemptions, no accommodations? No exemptions, okay. no accommodations. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you. Kareem, there was an um, announcement from the Department of Justice today about uh, a crackdown effort to interrupt a um, Russian state-sponsored uh, bot uh, operation, AI fuel operation, to um, denigrate politicians in the United States and elsewhere. Um, have, have you, do you have any concerns right now that this is the leading edge of any part of a Russian effort to interfere in the election? Has the president been briefed on this? And have you seen any evidence that the Russians or other foreign powers have tried to seize on the uh, debate performance to repeat some of the president's most embarrassing moments? So that's a very good question. Uh, I would have to talk to our team about those particular questions that you just asked. There were multiple questions uh, in your statement there. Uh, I would leave it to the Department of Justice as uh, what they announced. Obviously, that's for them to speak to. Look, AI has always been a concern. Uh, that's why the president uh, made some announcements recently in executive uh, to take executive action on how we can deal uh, with AI. We want to see more, uh, more action, more fulsome action legislatively from Congress. Uh, and that is something, it is a, it is a, techno a cutting edge technology uh, that we need to get our hands on uh, and make, get a better, uh, uh, you know, better uh, understanding of what it could potentially do. Uh, and so that is something that the, pr the president certainly uh, is, looking, uh, is looking to make sure that we deal with this in a full uh, uh, whole of government way. Uh, on those particular questions, I would have to check in uh, with our uh, uh, with our team here, and obviously whatever is related to the Department of Justice in that in that in, in that statement, I would refer you to them. Can yeah, that's great. Uh, you said uh, just a minute ago that the president wants to turn the page uh, on the on the last couple of weeks and get to the other side of this, where the White House wants to. Uh, you know, has President Biden seen enough? Uh, support uh, over the last 36 hours from fellow or from fellow Democrats in Congress uh, to now start turning the page and look ahead. I mean, what's his reaction been to uh, to what to what he's seen since Congress has gotten back? I mean, it's very similar to how I answered your, the question to one of your colleagues. He's very much focused on what's what's ahead. Right. He's very much focused. He has a fulsome, uh, robust schedule in the next two weeks that we laid out for all of you. He wants to focus on that. The messages that he wants to come out when he goes to Texas next week, when he goes to Vegas uh, next week, he's going to uh, d uh, gonna be on the road on Friday as well. I also want to say, look, you know, he is proud of, of the Congressional Black Caucus who said they have, uh, he, he has their support. The Congressional Hispanic Caucus did the same. Uh, and other, and other members of, con of Congress, obviously. And so, look, he wants to move forward. Uh, 
as your colleague said, definitely unite the unite uh, unite the party, continuing to the unite the party. Uh, we heard from Representative Meeks, who said the Democrats, uh, the congressional Democrats, came out of the meeting today uh, united. I think that's important to note. Uh, but the president's going to move forward. He's going to move forward, and he's going to uh, continue to go out there, engage, engage with the American public, like you saw him do in Pennsylvania. And he's going to stay focused on that. Well, do you feel, does he feel like he's weathered this storm, so to speak? Look, I think that he is more determined than ever uh, to continue to get the, the job done, to continue to uh, build an economy that, that uh, works for all, uh, to continue to make sure that we have a middle class, right, that is, that, that is strong, right, that we don't have a trickle-down economy, that we economy that's built from the bottom up, middle out. That's what he wants to continue to do. I think this week with the NATO summit, the 75th year of NATO, let's not forget, NATO uh, has helped to protect Americans and, for, and also protect uh, the world and what it's been able to do for the past 75 years. You're going to see the president uh, engaging with uh, 32 uh, leaders of this alliance. Uh, I think that's really important. That's, again, on behalf of the American people. So he wants to do that. He has a lot on his mind and as, as it deals with uh, making sure we deliver for the American people. That's what he's going to focus on. Okay, okay, Peter, I know we had our chat yesterday. Yes, thank you, Corrine. Okay. So Does President Biden commit to serving a full second term if reelected? Yes. Thank you. Uh, we know the president says that his health is fine, mm -hmm. but it's just his brain, and that he's sharpest before he eight. was joking, by the way. I just want to make sure that that's out there. And people, people, pe he was making a lighthearted joke as he was speaking he off, he was spe he's speaking off the cuff and he was making a joke. You know the president, he likes to joke a lot. Okay. He's the same guy who says, I know I look 40, right? So he likes That's to make joke. jokes. It is a joke. He, okay. I think people laugh when he says it. Well, he so also he said he's, he's sharpest before 8 p.m. So say that the Pentagon at some point picks up an incoming nuke. It's 11 p.m. Who do you call? The first lady? He has a team that uh, lets him know of any of any news that is pertinent and important to the American people. Uh, he has someone, or that is decided obviously with his National Security Council on who uh, gets to tell him that news. So Kevin McCarthy just said that when he was the speaker, many times when we had meetings in the Oval Office, Jill was there as well. When the first lady is in these meetings, is she making decisions or is she no. just advising the president? No, the president is the president of the United States. He makes decisions. Okay, another family member. President Biden has told me before, he and his son don't have any business dealings together. So what is Hunter Biden doing in White House meetings? Are you talking about the meeting where they came together from Camp David and the two of them walked to the president's meeting and he was there? There's a report that aides were struck by his presence during their discussions. Look, I can't, I'm, I'm certainly not going to get into uh, private conversations that, are, that occur. What I can say is, and I talked to this, I spoke to this before, is that uh, when they came back from Camp David, the president spent a, a couple days at Camp David with his family. Uh, he is very close to your, his family, as you know. It was the week of 4th of July, which is why his family members were here last week. They walked together, and they walked together into uh, the meeting. Can you say if Hunter Biden has access to classified information? No. And are you guys just not, since February, testing President Biden for Parkinson's or for dementia? Because if he gets a bad result, it's all over that day. Again, as I've said many times before, the president has had a fulsome, comprehensive, uh, uh, what we said, what we shared with you was comprehensive, but he's had a full uh, physical. We've, sh we've shown the results of those physicals this past three years. We showed it just four months ago. Uh, and it is in line with what we have done, uh, similar to President Obama, similar to George W. Bush. Uh, we are committed to continue to be transparent. We are committed to continue uh, to show uh, the results of those, uh, of those physicals. And look, it's the president's medical team that makes the decision. We are not, with all due respect, you're not a doctor, I'm not a doctor. It is the president's medical unit that makes a decision on what the president needs. Not a doctor, just yeah. play one on TV. 
Uh, but I know that's that scary. that is scary. <laughs> but I know that, especially as adults get into their 80s, health conditions can pop up more than just once a year when he's getting his physical. I think if my wife saw me on TV misspeaking or saying the wrong thing or yeah. seeing a change in my appearance, she would probably say, let's go to a doctor just to make sure that you are okay, you have a family, you have an important job. Why doesn't anybody in the president's family urge him just to go to get checked out to say the coast is clear? Okay, so just to step back just a little bit, because I think you weren't in the briefing room last week. I, I, I don't want to go backwards, but just to share a little bit about that night. The president said it was a bad night. Uh, he talked about it. He had a, a cold, right? He talked about his schedule, right, uh, being abroad. Uh, and so we have spoke about what that night was like for him. And we understand what the American people saw, what you all saw. We've spoken to that. And I also would say, uh, and I think you know this, Peter. You've you've covered a couple of administration at this point, administrations at this point, that the president, every president, has a White House medical unit uh, that is with him 24/7. That is available to him 24/7. That is unlike any other American, right? That is not the norm. That is uncommon. Just down on the other side of the colonnade is where the medical unit is. Uh, and I did share in the, that uh, the president checks in while he's exercising with his doctor on a couple times a week. Uh, and so he has that. He has something that most majority of Americans, all Americans I would probably argue, don't have, uh, which is a full medical unit that is with him at all times. Uh, and he gets a full full, full physical, annual physical that we share with all of you. And that is very different, very different than an everyday American who sometimes they're lucky if they can go get a physical. Uh, they have to get into a car. They have to take public transportation. The president has, again, a medical unit that's with him here at the White House and travels with So him. I guess the question is just, this is not, you're saying this is not a situation where you would rather just not know if there is an what issue I will with tell the president, is, because if he no. does get a bad result, it is all over. He first has to all, leave office right all, away. He can't run for re-election. First of all, it's a hypothetical, right, that, that you're giving me a hypothetical. But I will also say, just to clear this up, his, the White House medical unit, uh, his, his doctor, they don't believe that he needs anything more than what he, we have been able to provide, a full, full, d detailed, uh, very comprehensive physical uh, that he had four months ago. It is their decision to make. It's not yours. It's not mine. It's the White House, White House Medical Unit. Okay. Hi, uh, Green. You mentioned that the Democratic Party was united, perhaps the leadership, but a lot of rank and file Democrats have a lot of concerns. One of them, Steve Cohen, said today not only are they not on the same page, but they're not even in the same book. How does the White House, is the White House concerned about that? Look, we, I've said before, right, we respect congressional, congressional members. They have their opinions. We respect their opinions, many of them, that we've got, we had to, opportunities to deliver really, really good results on behalf of the American people. But there is. The whole Congressional Black Caucus, they support the president. The Congressional Hispanic Caucus support the president. Those are pretty impressive numbers. Uh, Senator Kuhn, Senator Fetterman support the president. There's also another list here that shows support for this president. You're going to have some congressional members who feel differently. It is, that is, that is up to them, right? The president wants to continue. He's going to have those conversations. He's going to engage with congressional members. He's going to continue to do that uh, as he has. Uh, that's not going to stop. Uh, obviously, the campaign is doing their work. We're doing, uh, continuing our engagement with congressional members as we do uh, pretty much all the time uh, on whatever issue we want to work with them on. So that's not going to change. You heard from uh, AOC, the, co the Congresswoman from New York. She said, the matter is closed and I support him. Right? You heard from Maxwell Fro Frost, who was on CNN uh, today, gave, was very supportive on CNN. So you do have others out there just today, just today or yesterday, giving support to the president. I can't, you know, it, you're mentioning one person, but there are others as well. Okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, on a separate topic sure. slightly, Senator Richmond this morning, he said that the, uh, the debate stage was words, the debate stage was performance. I would say look at actions and accomplishments. 
Uh, President allies have made some version of that argument and not pay attention to what he said on stage, but what his accomplishments uh, are. But when you're when you're the president of the United States, don't words matter? So, when you're the president of the United States, uh, I think any kind, any leader, right, especially including a former president, your words do matter. You're a hundred percent correct. Uh, the president has owned up to that night. He said it was a bad night. He said this. He said this many times. He's even said he screwed up. So those are the president's words. That's all I can give you at this time. We do believe that we should not just look at the 90 minutes. The president has had has done more than any other modern day presidents, administrations. Historic, historic things have gotten done. When I was watching the Democratic caucus, they talked about $35 uh, insulin, right? Capping that. When you think about seniors who are paying hundreds and hundreds of dollars, we were able to get that done uh, because of a, a very important piece of legislation that we, mo we moved through, right? Uh, and only Democrats made that happen. That's also because of the leadership of this president. And that's just one. That's a bipartisan infrastructure legislation. There's the Chips and Science Act. There's the, uh, the PACT Act for our veterans. I mean, there are things that he's been able to do that elected officials, presidents before him have been trying to do and could not get done. Get done. Beating, uh, beating Big Pharma. So there is a long list of impressive things that this president has been able to get done, getting us out of the pandemic, that we do believe is important to note here as well uh, as an accomplishment of this presidency. Another question that I don't think has been asked, correct me if it has. Yeah. Um, the White House and also the campaign has said that he had a cold that night. He then went to a watch party afterwards, which you have brought up. I was at that watch party. If he did have a cold, why then push into another event where he spent some 45 minutes along the rope line? I mean, and not just a, and I would add to that, it wasn't just a watch party. We landed at 2 a.m. in the morning in North Carolina. He greeted hundreds of uh, North Carolinians in North Carolina. He woke up the next day in North Carolina, gave uh, a speech uh, in front of uh, in front of thousands of North Carolinians. No, 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 I, I'm, I'm just I'm just trying to lay, you give you gave me an opportunity and I'm just using that opportunity, obviously, uh, to lay out what the president did in those uh, <laughs> two and a half days. Look, you know, one of the reasons that we share that he had a cold is because during the debate in real time, everybody heard his his hoarse voice and folks asked and we were able to come, we were able to confirm right away that he had a cold uh, and that um, and that he was also tested negative for, for COVID. So we were able to share that in real time. So just also want to share that. Look, he pushed forward, right? Many of us have colds and we still push forward. He's the president of the United States. He understand how important it is uh, to continue to get up every morning, regardless of how you feel, right, to get things done. That's how this president is. I'm sure, I'm sure that's how many presidents before him were as well, when it comes to really not letting a cold get you down. Uh, and, and I think that's also why he pushed forward uh, in the debate uh, also um, on, on that night. So. Look, he pushed forward, tried to get things done, wanted to make sure that he had an opportunity. People who watched him do a debate, who were waiting for him, people at 2 o'clock in the morning in North Carolina who were waiting for him, he wanted to make sure that he engaged uh, with Americans. And finally, Kareem, um, this morning House Speaker Mike Johnson said, as he has before, that Democrats have been covering up the president's mental acuity for years. How do you respond to that, and has the White House misled America? Uh, so I'll say this. Uh, Americans out there, folks who are watching, who are not normally in the day-to-day -day of what's happening in this world, there is a comprehensive uh, medical, full comprehensive medical report uh, on the website, whitehouse.gov. I would encourage them to take a look, to take a look. Read, read that report, uh, and they can also read for themselves uh, what his, his uh, you know, specialist, a group of specialists uh, the, of uh, coming out of the medical unit decided on what they examined, what they saw, what they reported on. I think that matters as well. Uh, it is a group of them that come together when it comes to doing their physical. It is extensive physical. And so there is something there for them. It's transparent. It's out there. It's for them to read. It's for the American, not just for you, for the American people to take a look. Uh, and I think that's important to note as well. And that's what I would share with them. 
Okay, and I'll come to yes. you, Ed, in a second. Okay. Thanks, Karina. Um, the president said yesterday in his letter, in his interview, that he talked to a wide range of voters. He overwhelmingly heard from people that they wanted him to stay in the race. Our polling shows that 76% of Democrats think he is too old to run this year. How is he coming to this conclusion? Are you sure that a handful of events is giving him a representative view of swing state voters? So look, I mean, look, that has been, you all have asked me about polling in his age for, I feel like a year now. It, it's come up many, many times. Uh, and, you know, I'm not going to speak to polls. It's not something I'm going to do from here. I'm just going to let the experts, the pundits, and all of you. He's saying he's conducting his no, own no, poll wait, I, I, was, I was about to answer your question. Just give me, give me a second. Look, for the past, Three and a half years, the president has been out there talking to voters. And if you think about, and I, what he was referring to when we went to, uh, when he went to Atlanta right after the watch party, he saw he he literally did a rope line. Some of your colleagues were there. Some of your colleagues spoke to uh, some of the folks who were there and heard from them directly. He heard from folks at the rope line. I mean, these are everyday engaging with everyday people. That's what he did. Landed at 2 a.m. In, in the morning in North Carolina, hundreds of people there. He did a rope line, engaged with everyday people. The next day, thousands of folks, thousands of people were at the North Carolina event, and you heard chants, let's go, Joe. We love you, Joe. I mean, that's something that you feel, right? That's something that you feel uh, out there, and that's what he feels out there. The next day, he went to New York, uh, and he was able to spoke to to speak to some supporters there and then went to New Jersey. So it is a continuation. On Sunday, 600 people at the church. The whole if you watch that that's that uh, uh, that service, you heard you heard from that congregation. If you watched him in Harrisburg, you saw people, you saw him engaging with people. I mean that there's nothing that takes away all respect to the polling out there, but nothing takes away, I don't think, from engaging with everyday Americans. I think that matters too. And that's just I'm just laying out the last 10 or 12 days, right? That's just the last 10 or 12 days. One more. Um, over the weekend, the New York Times reported on a senior White House official who apparently had worked with the president in his vice presidency in the 2020 campaign, said he shouldn't seek re-election. They thought he was not up to it and was showing signs of his age. Does, does the White House know who this person is or made any effort to find out? And are you comfortable having someone who apparently is traveling with him and working with him in this way who thinks this? I, I mean, look, that is, uh, that is the... First time I've ever heard that was in that reporting. Uh, you know, we this is not uh, this is not the last administration where we try to find who is you know speaking or leaking. That's not something that we do here. Uh, everybody has their opinion, but that is the first time I've ever heard anything like that. I've never heard any speak anyone speak in that way from here. Get it. To follow up on something you were saying, gave about congressional outreach. Yeah. Has the president spoken to? Does he plan to? speak with any of those that have publicly called for him to go? Look, uh, I don't have a list of people that the president's going to call. He's going to engage with congressional members. That's something that he's going to do. Uh, I can say, you know, I'm, I'm sure folks here uh, in his Office of Ledge Affairs has had regular communication with everyone. Uh, I just don't have a list of who he's going to speak to. But the president is always willing to speak to people who agree with him and don't agree with him. You know that about him. If you've covered him, he's very much uh, that type of, uh, of president. Uh, I just don't want to get ahead of, of his decision on who he's going to call and how that's going to look. One thing I don't think we've gotten public clarification about yet. Yeah. Uh, in the interview Friday night, he was asked, did you watch the debate? And he said, I don't think I did, no. Did he watch the full debate, or what you know, of it has he watched? You know, that's a good question. I should, I didn't, never followed up with him, and I meant to. I, I have not asked him that question. I was there in the room when he was being asked that question. I just never followed up. Uh, you know, that is something that, you know, we could follow up with him on. I, I have not. Okay. I'm sure he's seen clips. I'm sure he's seen clips. I just haven't, uh, I just haven't ha asked hard, him that full question. Point, though, so I could, yeah. um, <laughs> one other thing that's come yeah, up. Yeah, it's just getting round, round the clock coverage, right? From all of you. <laughs> uh, one other thing that's come up in the last little bit, uh, the Director of National Intelligence, mm -hmm. Avril Haines, I don't know if you've seen this, issued a statement a little while ago yeah. saying in part, in recent weeks, Iranian government actors have sought to opportunistically take advantage of ongoing protests regarding the war in Gaza, the playbook we've seen other actors use over the years. We've observed actors tied to Iran's government 
posing as activists online, seeking to encourage protests, and even providing financial support to protesters. She goes on later to urge Americans to remain vigilant as they engage online with accounts and actors they don't personally know. But that's a pretty big charge to make, that Iran may be trying to influence these protests in the streets of the United States. So yes, I, I know what you're speaking of, uh, what the DNI warned about. Obviously for any specifics, I would have to refer you back uh, to Director Haynes and her statement. But broadly speaking here, just bear with me for a second, uh, Iran is seeking to opportunistically uh, take advantage of protest. Uh, so I want to echo uh, the DNI's remarks today. Uh, Americans across the, the political spectrum acting in good faith have sought to express their own uh, independent views on the conflict in Gaza. The freedom to express diverse views when done peacefully is essential to our democracy. At the same time, the U.S. government has a duty to warn Americans about foreign malign influences activities. This is, uh, this is important to help Americans guard against efforts by foreign powers to take advantage of or co-opt their legitimate protest activities. We will continue to provide these warnings as they arise. And today, I just want to convey and, and a firm message uh, from here to Iran and any other foreign actor that seeks to conduct these types of influence activities, meddling in our politics and seeking to stroke division is unacceptable. And we will continue to expose attempts to undermine our democracy and our society just as we are today. That is something that we will continue to do. The U.S. government will continue to vigorously support and defend Americans in their exercise of their First Amendment rights to protest and express political views peacefully. At the same time, we will continue to warn against expose uh, foreign efforts to meddle in our inter internal affairs and attempt to amplify conflict. The former is an essential part of the robust functioning democracy. The latter is a threat, and it will not, it will not, will not be tolerated. And the president's been read into all this. He's There's been no briefed. problem with it being shared publicly. He's been briefed. He's been read, read in. He is aware. And it, we believe, as I just stated here, it is our duty. It is our duty uh, here as a U.S. government to share that. Okay. Um, I have a question about the NATO summit. Sure. Um, there has been a lot of um, discussion about Ukraine, but also the southern flank of NATO, countries like Italy and Spain, they want the summit to approve a new strategy to improve relations with countries in North Africa, the Middle East, and work together in challenges like migration or instability. So does the U.S. support this, and is the president trying to, or planning to meet with any leaders uh, of the southern flank? So look, I think we announced uh, some of the bilateral. Uh, we announced the one with the UK uh, Prime Minister. I just announced with President Zelensky. Uh, we will do our best. You know, the president is hosting uh, the 75th NATO summit, so he's going to be pretty busy engaging uh, with global leaders and obviously hosting the event. So if we have anything more to share, I know my colleagues at the National Security Council will do our best to share that with you. Uh, I'm not going to, we're going to have some deliverables, we're going to have uh, some, uh, you know, some uh, statements to make, declarations. I'm not going to get ahead of any of that. Uh, so I'm just going to let this let this summit begin uh, and let the president actually lead 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 these in the next couple of days. Does uh, the president support this strategy? I'm 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 saying to you, I'm not just I'm not going to get ahead of the summit. We're going to have many conversations, uh, many many meetings here. I just want to be super mindful. You also asked me about any other uh, bilateral engagement. We have, we've already announced two, uh, and uh, and so just don't want to get ahead of anything else. I, you know, things happen when the president is there. He gets pulled to the side. We do pull asides. We try to share them in real time as quickly as possible. I just don't have anything to share outside of that. Okay. Um, sticking with NATO, are there any details you can share on President Biden's meeting with President Zelensky? Just any you know details on potentially what they might discuss if Biden had um, said he would announce new air defense for Ukraine. Will that come up at all? We will definitely, uh, there will be more air defense uh, that we will be announcing. Don't want to get ahead of the president. Uh, look, you saw, as I announced at the top, you saw the president do a bilat with uh, President Zelensky in France and also at the G7. It is always, obviously, part of those uh, conversations is to continue to show our unwavering support for Ukraine. The president has led in this effort globally, right? If you think about NATO and how the strength of NATO and how uh, it has uh, 
has grown plus two uh, and how we have been able to have a stronger alliance than we've ever had before. That's because of this president and backing obviously behind uh, Ukraine. That's because of this president. So our support continues to be unwavering uh, and uh, we will have more to read out. Uh, from that, from that bylaw. And as it's the 75th anniversary, um, you know, by, it's here in D.C. obviously, but what does the success look like for Biden given everything that is going on and kind of the debate aftermath? Kind of, what is he measuring? Um, so I, I'll say this, and I've, I've said this many times before as it relates to foreign leaders. Um, and look, I'll say that the foreign leaders have had an opportunity to see what the president has been able to do in the last three and a half years. They've seen that uh, certainly up close and personal uh, uh, the last three years. Uh, and they know that they are dealing with a president who has been effective and has just has been able to get things done. I just talked about NATO and the president's leadership and how we've been able to strengthen NATO, uh, ma make sure that we invigorate it. Uh, the NATO alliance, and that has that we've been able to to see in the last three and a half years. So the president wants to continue to strengthen those that partnership uh, and strengthen those alliances. Obviously, it's not going to just be NATO uh, NATO uh, allies here. We're going to see others, uh, for example. Japan will be here uh, on Thursdays and other other uh, other heads of states. I believe there's going to be 38 heads of states that will be here. And so we want to st continue to strengthen uh, those relationships, and that's what the president wants to see. It is an important year, the 75th anniversary, uh, and I think all of the work that the president has been able to do will be on full display. Just one last question. If the president's health um, were to decline rapidly next week, just kind of out of the blue, um, have you had any conversations with, with him, or has he made any Comments no, on absolutely not. That's a hypothetical. No. Okay. Karine, uh, stay on the NATO summit. Uh, while the summit, of course, is being held in Washington, China is criticizing NATO as the relic of Cold War. It's causing high security risk to the world and the region. Uh, what is the White House's response to this? So look, uh, Russia's aggression against Ukraine poses a threat to transatlantic security. That's what it does. And it shows how critical the NATO alliance is and how important it is to continue to make sure that it is strong. And that's what the president has been able to do. Uh, I am not surprised, we are not surprised, uh, that China doesn't understand that through, that though considering uh, how they are actively enabling, right, they are themselves enabling uh, Russia's war in Ukraine, so it doesn't surprise me or surprise us that that statement was made. Uh, but uh, look, NATO is an, is an important alliance. Uh, it's been around for 75 years, protecting uh, here uh, U.S. America Americans, American citizens, but also the world. And so uh, we are going to continue to strengthen that alliance. A second question. Uh, Indian Prime Minister Modi is visiting Russia. We all seen the footage that he's hugging, being friendly with Putin, also seeking deepened bilateral relationship. We see that, uh, saw that Ukrainian President Zelensky already expressed his disappointment. Is the United States concerning that India, as a U.S. ally, might be actually adding Russia either unintentionally or intentionally. I believe my uh, NSC colleagues have spoken to this. I'll just add that uh, and just reiterate that India is a strategic partner with whom we engage in full and frank dialogue, including their relationship with Russia. And we've talked about this before. Uh, so we think it's critical that all countries, including India, support efforts to, re to realize uh, an enduring and just peace when it comes to Ukraine. It is important for all our allies to realize this. Uh, and so we also believe India's longstanding relationship with Russia gives it the ability to urge the, the president, President Putin, to end his brutal war, an unprovoked war in Ukraine. Uh, it is for President Putin to end. They started, President Putin started the war, and President Putin can end the war. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you, Kareem. Uh, a couple questions on unrelated uh, subjects. First, uh, there's been some reporting by my uh, colleagues in the British press that uh, His Majesty King Charles would like to visit his grandchildren in California and uh, could do so uh, in conjunction with a state visit. Uh, has there been any discussion or will there be any discussion between President Biden and uh, Prime Minister Starmer about such a visit? Uh, so 
I don't have anything to share. Uh, that is something, obviously, that the State Department and NSC would certainly engage on if that were to be the case. As you know, uh, the, in, the new Prime Minister will be here uh, for the NATO alliance. I just mentioned that there will be a bi bilat between uh, President Biden and the new Prime Minister, so the President looks forward to that. Uh, an upcoming visit uh, that involves uh, the King, King Charles. I don't have anything to share at this time. Okay, next question. Uh, the President, uh, yesterday on Morning Joe, said he wanted to make sure uh, that the, the average voter out there uh, still wants uh, Joe Biden uh, to be running for President. And you've uh, rattled off a, a long list of, of campaigning engagements <coughs> that he's had uh, over the last uh, 10 or so days since the debate. Uh, those engagements, uh, whenever the President travels, whether it's part of the campaign or official travel, there are advanced teams. Uh, people who get near him are screened, either by uh, the Secret Service or the campaign or both. Uh, so how are these groups of people he's meeting with uh, supporters of his? They, they are supporters. They, they get to these official events, these, these official campaign events. They are, uh, they are known to be supporters of the campaign. They self-select by coming to his events. How is a, how are groups of people that come to his events, yeah. uh, make the time out of their day to do that, and are, are vetted by the campaign and allowed into these events, representative of the average voter? And, and I have one more. So look, I'm going to be really careful because you're asking me a political question. You would have to talk to the campaign on how uh, the process works, I'm right? No, wait. You, okay. well, give me a second. Give me a second. Um, on how uh, how that process works on who's in who's a, who's at the these uh, campaign events. So I just want to make that clear because I have to say that from here uh, and and make that clear. I would I would remind you that 14 million people. This is something that I can talk about. Voted for the president in the primary. That's 87 percent of the vote. That matters. Those numbers matter. Uh, and uh, so that is kind of. A reality, a data point that matters as well, um, and so I'll just leave it there. But I think it does matter. Uh, I hear the question that you're asking. He's still engaging with everyday people. He's still hearing directly from them. They're still sharing information, sharing how they feel, sharing how they see the future uh, of uh, the, his presidency, and I think that matters as well. Uh, as far as who's in the room, how that's that, how that comes together, who's in front of him, you would have to speak to the campaign about okay. that. And last thing, uh, you've described his uh, his engagements with Dr. O'Connor on a regular basis as as check-ins. Uh, that's what you've described him having uh, after the debate—a a, check-in uh, versus an exam. Can you uh, elaborate on what the difference is between a check-in? Uh, and an exam uh, at these check-ins, does, does Dr. Connor or another staff member take the president's vitals or, or anything like that? So I've talked about this on Friday. They're verbal check-ins with the president. They check in. As the president's exercising, that's usually how this happens. Uh, and they're not a medical exam. I've said this already. I've cleared that up. They're not, it's not a physical. Uh, it is a verbal check-in that the president does multiple times uh, with uh, with his doctor. Uh, it's normally uh, as he's working out. Does anyone from the medical unit uh, take the president's vitals on a regular basis? I, what I can tell you, is he gets regular check-ins. Uh, he does regular check-ins a couple times a week with um, uh, with Dr. O'Connor, and that is for his doctor to decide on. That is not something that I can speak to from here. Go ahead, Karen. Um, uh, thank you. The president's come out very aggressively in the past 24 hours from that letter to Democrats, the call into MSNBC, the phone call with donors, the CDC last night. Uh, was that his decision personally yes. to step up that outreach? It has been. He, he is. He's. He's ready. He's. He's on fire. He's ready to go, uh, and he wants to get out there uh, and continue uh, to show that he has more work to do. Right. He has more. Uh, more important issues for the American people uh, to get done. And so he wants to get out there. He's always has, though. I mean, the last two, two and a half years, three years, uh, three and a half years, he 
looks forward to getting out there speaking directly to the American people. Uh, and he, I know we say this, and I know sometimes you guys don't believe us, but he does want to engage with you all. He does want to talk more to the press. And so now we're, we're certainly going to continue to create opportunities to do that. He's done interviews 47 times in this year alone, and we're going to continue to create opportunities to do this. We're going to get out there so he can engage uh, with the American people more directly. So we're going to continue to do that. But in terms of, you know, especially in the last 24 hours, yeah. that type of outreach to ease concerns among Democrats about his campaign continuing, was there something specific that he heard or read that prompted this, it would seem more like a flurry over the last 24 hours, that no. didn't happen last week? We yeah. really saw him doing no, more. I get it. Yesterday. No, I get the question. Look, I, I wouldn't say there's anything specific. This is something that he wanted to do. Uh, and if you if you think about it, you know, he was he's been on the road a lot uh, since since the uh, uh, since the debate. He was on the road on Friday. He was on the road on Sunday. And then right out of the debate. Right. He did about two. Uh, he did two and a half days of going into about four states. So he's just been on the road, busy uh, engaging with with uh, with Americans. But and he did the ABC interview, as you know, obviously. Uh, and so he wants to do more. He wants to do more. There's nothing specific, but he understands. He understands what what you all saw, right? He understand he had a bad debate. He understand that Ameri what Americans saw. So he wants to go out there and continue to prove to all of you that uh, you know he continue to can continue to do the work and, does and the he job. Feel that outreach is working to ease those concerns after the bad debate. I mean, look, I think he's you know this is kind of the questions that I got from other colleagues. He's hearing directly from the American people, and I think that matters. You know, uh, I think. Uh, I think him being out there and them and Americans seeing him directly, being able to touch him and ask him questions and see him face to face, I think that matters. Uh, and so, look, we're going to continue to move forward and do and do what we have to do. All right, I think I can take one more. Go ahead, Aria. Thank you so much. Uh, so we, we've seen the president like being on the ground uh, more, but we've also heard a slightly new tone from him. He said he was frustrated with the elites of his party. He dismissed polls. He criticized uh, media coverage, saying that like, journalists get election results wrong. So is this the kind of tone uh, we should expect to hear from him going forward? And does he believe this is the kind of tone that the average voters, as he says, expect from him? Look, I would say this. I think. I think what we've seen the last 10 to 12 days is certainly fundamental to the Joe Biden story. He is someone that is certainly counted out many, many times in his career. Uh, people uh, tend to tend to knock him down and you hear him say he gets back up. This is the story. This is the story of him standing up for himself, standing up for millions of Americans uh, and, uh, and certainly millions of Americans who back his leadership and like him, care. They care about working people. They care about getting things done. And I, I you know, it really truly is uh, who he is at his car to fight, uh, to fight not just for himself, but what he believes in. And he has seen this over and over again. People count him out. People say he's not going to win. People say, you know, all of the, <laughs> all of the, uh, the negative things that they want to put at his feet. And he proves them wrong over and over again. You think about 2020, folks said the same thing. He's not going to win. He's not going to make it. And he won. In 2022, we had a midterm election. Uh, and going into that midterm election, it was supposed to be a red wave. There wasn't a red wave. Happened in 2023. Now we're in 2024. Uh, and he's going to continue to fight. That is his commitment. That is quintessential Joe Biden story that is fundamentally who he is, is to continuing to fight. All right. Thanks, everybody.